and I bring to you this beautiful icon of Our Lady of Chesnahoma, a faithful replica of the original icon. Technically, we would call it a newly written icon of Our Lady of Chesnahoma. And we speak of icons as being written rather than painted because the icon is seen in the East as the gospel written in picture form. Poland has always been kind of a bridge between the East and the West. I myself am not Polish, but yet I've come to uh, have a great appreciation for icons in general, and the icon of Our Lady of Czestochowa in particular. In the East, they see the icon as kind of a window into heaven that makes visible the invisible world, a spiritual connection between the one who prays and God, the spiritual presence of the person portrayed, and in this case, the Blessed Mother and the Christ Child. Everything about an icon is symbolic, even the very shape of an icon. An icon is always square or rectangular because it represents the world and its limits, but it's also the place where we encounter the divine. The blue in this icon is representative of Mary's humanity, the red of Christ's divinity, and the gold represents eternity or heaven. The icon always represents a resurrected or transfigured figure that has overcome sin, overcome death. We see the gold shining through the clothing of the Blessed Mother and the Christ Child, surrounded with a golden halo. So they, they are now shared eternal glory, and that is the destiny of every single human being. Blessed John Paul II, in his encyclical letter the Gospel of Life, said that every human being is a manifestation of God, a sign of His presence, and a trace of His glory. So that's the dignity of, of human life, that we were made first in the image and likeness of God, that we remain in a special relationship with God throughout our lives, and that we're directed to God as our final end, that we're meant to share eternal glory with Him. And he teaches us that whatever we do to the least of our brothers and sisters, that we do to him. All of us are called to build up the culture of life. It was for this reason Eva Kowalewska, the country director of Human Life International in Poland, wrote this beautiful icon and gave it as a gift to the Russian Orthodox pro-life movement who had the idea of a from ocean to ocean pilgrimage in defense of human life. They had the idea that just as the Jews would take the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle in the Old Testament, and when they were faithful to God, they were victorious over their enemies, so also we would bring the icon into the battle for life. You know, early in, uh, in Russian history, and uh, their, when they went through their war of 1812 and Napoleon had invaded their land, uh, the Russian army carried before them an icon, an icon of Our Lady of Kazan, into battle with them as they drove Napoleon out of their, out of their land. And so that is basically what we are doing with the, with the icon, carrying Our Lady before us, recognizing that she is the one who crushes the head of Satan by our own power that we would be it would be unable to overcome what John Paul II called a culture of death. He spoke about a great clash occurring in our society between a culture that affirms, cherishes, and celebrates life, and a culture that seeks to declare entire groups of human beings, the unborn, the terminally ill, the handicapped and others who are considered to be unuseful to be outside the boundaries of legal protection. The culture of death is satanic. It, and we cannot overcome it by ourselves. We need spiritual help. This is a spiritual war. 
and we need spiritual means to overcoming our, our enemy. And Mary is the most powerful weapon that we have. Our Blessed Mother and Jesus in the Eucharist. Father John Hartman, a Jesuit priest, once said that there is no overcoming abortion without the Eucharist. And also, I, I believe also with the Blessed Virgin Mary, we need her powerful intercession. We also need St. Joseph as well, who was at our, the, uh, during the apparitions of, of Fatima, that the, our Lord appeared with the, the Blessed Mother and that our Lord was in the arms of St. Joseph as he blessed the world. St. Joseph is a model for, for men and a model for all of us in, in patience, in, in humility. He doesn't say anything in, in the Gospels, but yet his powerful presence is there, caring for our Lord, remaining faithful, he also had a, a message delivered to him from an angel, a message that perhaps was hard to believe, but yet he accepted it as the will of God. He understood his role to be the guardian of the Redeemer. That is one of the letters that Pope John Paul II wrote about Saint Joseph, calling him the guardian of the Redeemer. He is uh, an example for, for us men to be guardian and custodians of human life. He protected Jesus when he was threatened by, by her and helped the Blessed Mother and Jesus escape to, to safety in Egypt. He taught Jesus his trade of carpentry. He cared for him. He was a silent but constant presence. Uh, through, and we believe that he is also a patron of a holy death because tradition holds that he died surrounded by, by Jesus and Mary. So we ask St. Joseph also to help us to overcome the, the culture of death. I want to tell you a little brief history of the icon of Our Lady of Chesterhova. The original icon was said to have been written by St. Luke the Evangelist, the writer of the Third Gospel, on a table that came from the home of the Holy Family, a table that may have been made by St. Joseph, or even by, by Christ himself. That it was hidden away in a cave in the year 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, but in the year 326, St. Helena found it when she came to the Holy Land to identify the holy places and to find relics, such as the relic of the true cross. And she brought this icon back to Constantinople, where her son, the emperor, built a beautiful chapel for her. And it remained there for 500 years, often credited with saving the city from attack from the Saracens. It was often given as a gift uh, to uh, passed on as a gift between royal families. And it was given to the, the Princess of Ruthenia as a wedding gift, modern day uh, Russia and Ukraine. And these are nations that we need to, to pray for right now, that there might be peace because it looks very, uh, very dangerous and it's a dangerous situation that may lead to an all out war and a war that may bring in other nations as well. So we, we need to pray for, for peace. But it, it was at one point on the Polish-Ukrainian border, it spent a good couple hundred years in, in Ukraine, and where it came under attack of the Muslim Tartars. And so Prince Ladislaus, who was in charge of it at that time, believed that he needed to move it further to the west for safekeeping. And as the horses were dragging, you know, they're pulling the wagon out of town with the icon, as they were coming through, as they were coming through the village of Chestahova, they wouldn't move any further. And the prince saw that as a sign that that's where the icon should remain. And so, and he built and had a beautiful chapel built for her, and it was on the Feast of the Assumption that, um, and 
the, around the Feast of the Assumption that our, our Blessed Mother came to, to Poland. So that is a very special feast uh, in, uh, in Polish, uh, Polish history. Uh, but uh, they, they called for the name from the Pauline Fathers from the nation of Hungary to come and care for her. And so the icon has been in Poland since the year 1382 to care for her by the Pauline Fathers. Many people ask about why our Blessed Mother is, they call her the Black Madonna. She has dark skin. And there are various theories about that. Some say it was the candles burning over the years that darkened the image. Others say that she was damaged by fire. Others say that she had not naturally dark skin to begin with. But others say it was simply a style of iconography. My own opinion is probably a combination of some or all of those factors. But uh, then also people ask about the marks on Our Lady's face. That was done by the Hussites, followers of a renegade Czech priest by the name of Jan Hus. They did not believe in the sacred images. They first tried to destroy the image. They tried to steal the image. And when they, they couldn't steal the image, they cast her a wet, uh, off the, the wagon which she was being pulled again as they were taking, trying to take her out of town. The horses wouldn't move. And so the, uh, the Hussites in the rage, they threw her to the ground, they broke her into three pieces, and they slashed her with a sword. They were able to recover the icon and repair her somewhat, but yet those scars remain. And it seems that Our Lady wants us to know that she has suffered, but therefore she can identify with a suffering people. And the people of Poland have always seen her as symbolic of their, their martyred nation. And it's very interesting too that uh, some people, uh, some women who were involved in the ministry of post-abortion healing and reconciliation have a deep devotion to Our Lady of Czestochowa. Uh, I think particularly of Teresa Kaminsky Burke, who uh, is the founder of Rachel's Vineyard Retreats, spiritual exercises for both men and women who have been wounded by abortion to help them to find healing and peace. She has a deep devotion to our, our Lady of Chastel and has seen this, this, uh, this particular icon, this newly written icon in Austria, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and in Florida. Uh, so Our Lady seems to be following her around a little bit. Uh, or Teresa's following her, either way. But there's another Teresa too, Teresa Bonapartis, who wrote Lumina Hope and Healing, another abortion healing ministry. Teresa Bonapartis herself has had an abortion, and so uh, she struggled for many years um, because she could not accept God's forgiveness. She couldn't forgive herself for, for what she had done. But eventually she came to, to understand God's mercy and forgive herself, and she wants to help women, other women who are in the same situation as she was, to find healing, to find mercy, to find peace. Uh, and she has a great, deep devotion to Our Lady of Chastelva. And I think it's not really they who chose Our Lady of Chastelva, but Our Lady of Chastelva who chose them. Now this icon has been touched to the original icon. It was blessed by the Archbishop of Czestochowa. And an act of entrustment of the civilization of life and love, and the, the, the civilization of life and love was made into the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary and in Czestochowa. And I was privileged to be there to read that prayer in English. It was also read in Polish and in Russian as well. But after that, it went to Vladivostok on the Pacific coast of Russia, it went all through Siberia with there hardly any roads, to Moscow, uh, to Belarus, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy, Austria, Switzerland, uh, Austria, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Germany, uh, to Belgium, Great Britain, Ireland, where most of my ancestors came from. And then to uh, to France, to uh, Spain, Portugal, 
uh, to the United States and now here to Canada. So, uh, when she entered Canada just a few days ago and you know, went to uh, the parish of Our, Our Lady of Trespova in Montreal, Canada became the 26th country that this icon has, has been to on her journey around the world. And she will reach the Pacific Coast on July 4th, and then she'll go up to Vancouver, and after that, travel down the Pacific Coastline, go back into the interior of the United States a little bit, ending in the United States in November 1st, and then going on to Mexico, Central America, South America, and beyond. And all along the way, prayers are being offered for the defense of human life. Uh, and you know, some spectacular things have happened along the way. I speak of our, our Lady's role as being the Mother of Mercy, leading us uh, to her Divine Son, who shows us love and mercy in Russia. Uh, women who have had abortions were spontaneously coming up to the icon, confessing sins of uh, past abortions. In France, children came up to the icon, ran up to her as if they were running up to their own mother. And of course, that is what Mary is, the mother of us all. In Maryland, uh, at a place where they do late-term abortions, three women changed their minds, decided not to go through with planned abortions. In uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, we processed her through the streets eight-tenths of a mile in eight degree, eight degree Fahrenheit temperature, temperatures, and uh, there was a woman coming out as just as we approached the park of the Planned Parenthood where they were doing abortions. A woman came out of the parking lot, she had a big smile on her face, and she told the women that we were praying with that she changed her mind. She decided to keep her baby. Uh, in Orlando, Florida, a woman gave the thumbs up to St. Girl to a woman who we had been praying with. So there, she, she decided to keep her baby. In Dallas, Texas, there was a woman um, who saw the icon, may have thought it was Our Lady of Guadalupe, but she also changed her mind. She said, no abortion, no abortion. And that's another wife that, that has been saved. In Tallahassee, Florida, we found out that one of the places that we visited, uh, an abortion mill there, will be closing its stores and no longer offering abortion services after March 31st. So Our Lady is, is having an effect. This pilgrimage is, is having an effect. Uh, so we ask your continued prayers for, for me, for the work of Human Life International in defending life and family around the world, and uh, your continued prayers for the success of the promotion of ocean pilgrimage in defense of human life. I hope you can stay for the Mass. I'm not going to be able to speak this long during the Mass. I have three minutes to summarize everything I just told you. <laughs> so, but <laughs> um, I hope that you'll come uh, and take one of these uh, holy cards and touch it to the icon and keep it as a remembrance of the visit of Our Lady here today. Remember that this icon was touched to the original in, in Poland. Uh, and also, I hope that you uh, will keep in contact with Human Life International. My assistant there, Chris Morales, is, he's a nice guy, and he will talk to you. You can talk to him. And he will uh, take your email address, and, um, and so we can keep in contact with you. Or if you don't have an email, your mailing address, that would be, be fine. So we can keep in contact with you and let you know about uh, um, the further progress of the promotion of ocean pilgrimage and some of the other things that Human Life International is, is doing throughout the world. Uh, so, and there's also, I believe, a donation basket back there to help Our Lady on her journey as well. God bless you.